Good morning. Welcome to Greenfield Hill Church from the Smith family. Have a good, Have a good day. day. Thanks so much to the Smith family for welcoming us into worship today. This is indeed the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before God, our maker. Well, we are coming to you on a Sunday when things are really getting lively around here. Today on the church grounds, we are welcoming our church school kids back into the classrooms for the first time in a very long time. And our deacons and junior deacons are hosting the all church picnic that we haven't been able to have in two years. So if you happen to be in the area around 1130 this morning, come on by. We'd love to see you. Worship will be happening in our sanctuary this morning at 9 o'clock and 10.30, and that will be our regular in-person schedule from here on out. Our youth groups are getting underway. This past week, we had a great turnout at both meetings of our high school youth group, SPF. Any high school teen is welcome to come join us on a Tuesday or a Thursday evening at 6 o'clock in the Len Morgan Youth Barn. We're meeting outside for now. And Bible study, led by David, also kicked off this past week. That's Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. right here in our church sanctuary. There is so much going on and much more to come, including our Pinfield party on the evening of Sunday the 19th next weekend. And next weekend in worship, the kids who participated in our Appalachia service project trip this past summer will be leading worship and sharing reflections from their time. So... If you'd like to know all that's going on, make sure you're getting our news and notes email each week. And if you aren't, let us know your email address so that you can be looped into all this good stuff. We're going to turn to David now, who's going to tell you a little about what's coming later in the service. This is kind of a sneak peek at the sermon he'll be sharing a little later this morning. David. Two years ago, I sat in a cafe in Paris and began to write my newest book. On all of our trips, uh, Alita and I like to have what we call the occasional Alita day. That's when she goes on a longer walk than I want to walk to go to things that I don't want to go to and see things that I don't want to see. It doesn't happen often, maybe once a week or once a trip. That's not too bad. She goes her way and then I find a coffee house. Thus began my Jesus. Although I think we could go back even further. I used to be a runner, ran every day almost for decades, and often used my running time to pray, to talk with God. On one of the runs, when I had reached the half century mark in my life, I renegotiated my contract with God. I asked God for permission to do two things in the rest of my career. Number one, to err on the side of loving too much rather than too little. I had seen too much of religion in general and churches in particular, working hard to exclude people, to keep people away, to love them too little. I wanted to use the rest of my life to love too much. Second, I asked God to let me use the rest of my pastoral ministry to concentrate on Jesus. He was all I could handle. I had spent much of my life immersed in world religions. Now, I'm no expert, but I knew them pretty well, often from the inside. I'd worshiped with Buddhists and Hindus. I'd preached in mosques and synagogues. I'd studied for years at Harvard School of World Religions. I had my master's and doctorate in the area of religion. But it was just too much. It was too expansive, too confusing for my little brain. I can barely grasp all of Christianity, with all of our denominations and divisions and doctrines. So I said to God, while running the back roads of New England, let me focus on Jesus. Let me center my life and my work and my ministry on Jesus. Yes, 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 I know all about the Trinity. I know about transubstantiation, biblical inerrancy, reincarnation, predestination. I know creeds and dogmas, St. Paul and the Reformation. I know who's allowed to get communion and who gets rejected. And I, I know about speaking in tongues and high church versus low church and televangelists and theology. It all just makes my head spin. So I figured I could spend the rest of my life making my own head spin and the rest of my career making your head spin, or we could get to the heart of the matter, and that's Jesus. 
So at this little cafe in Paris, I began to work. The Jesus of history, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of pop culture, the Jesus of tradition, the Jesus in his own words, the Jesus in everybody else's words, and finally the bottom line, my Jesus. The Jesus of my life, the Jesus of my experience, the Jesus of my understanding. And an invitation to you to do the same, to think through the Jesus of your experience, the Jesus of your understanding and your needs, your Jesus. Today, I introduce that new book to you of my lifelong journey with Jesus. It's out there in the Narthex, it'll be in the church office, it'll be round and about for the next several weeks, $10 a copy. I will bring it to you in sermons chapter by chapter in the year ahead. We'll use it in Bible study beginning in October. And Jesus will be the focus of this year's Advent devotional, looking at him every which way, my Jesus and yours. This will be a great journey together. Wherever we look, we see God's gifts in our lives. We are conscious always of God's amazing grace. As we listen now to Wendy Gerbier singing Amazing Grace, we invite you to use this time of offering to make your gift to this church. You can go to our website, greenfieldhillchurch.com. The tab that says Giving will tell you how to make your gift very easily, either online or just by texting us. And now, let's listen to Wendy. Amazing grace, my 
For our scripture this morning, we are reading scriptures from throughout the biblical text, all of them centered on who Jesus is for us. Listen now for the word of God from Isaiah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. From Luke, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save us from our sins. Matthew, he is Emmanuel. God with us. John's Gospel. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, who came from God, full of grace and truth. And from the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the vine, the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. After Alita finished her COVID quarantine in Spain, she had one free day to do some sightseeing. Museum? Check. Botanical garden? Check. The cathedral? Check. But she also found a little out-of-the-way church that we'd never seen, the Church of San Jose. And when she returned here to America, she told me that I would have loved it. It was the perfect David Rowe church. Dark, somber, with a dead, bloody, life-size Jesus laying at the bottom of the cross. And Alita is right. That awfulness touches my soul. Despite a lifetime in cheery New England Protestantism, despite a lifetime of stories of Jesus surrounded by little children and a sheep perhaps carried on his shoulders, being nice and helpful and generous to everyone, rich and poor, friend and foe, young and old, My church memories are happy, my Jesus memories are happy, and the Jesus of my Jesus is an entirely positive force. And yet Alita is right. I am drawn to the crucified Christ, to the sacrifice, the agony, the loneliness, the loss. Jesus carrying his cross, Jesus on the cross, Jesus being brought down off the cross, then cradled in his mother's arms like Michelangelo's Pietà perfectly capturing the the horror and the beauty, the sorrow and the purpose, the evil and the love. Jesus is the ultimate paradox, contradiction, enigma, an exclamation point and a question mark, humanity and divinity all wrapped up together. We are the inheritors of Jesus Christ. Whether we are Christians or consumers of our culture, our understanding of Jesus is 2,000 years in the making. I was reading about a church with gigantic stained glass windows recently, featuring a really white Jesus, a lily white Jesus. And they've been trying to figure out how to keep those stained glass windows and not undo the beauty of their church, but still cover up this way too white Jesus. And in a parallel to my recent sermon about lawn songs, they created a tree-like art piece so that the, the tree trunk and its branches cover up Jesus' flesh. You still have the lovely stained glass, but no white Jesus. To tell you the truth, I don't fault the stained glass artist or the church. We grow up knowing what we know. The Jesus of most of my life has been Western Northern European white. I grew up with a mass media post-World War II Madison Avenue Hollywood Jesus. When we went to the movies to see King of Kings or The Greatest Story Ever Told or Ben-Hur, Jesus pretty much looked like me, just taller. 
At church, we were taught Bible stories by film strip and flannel graph. Film strips were like slideshows linked together, one set scene following another. Flannel graph was like cutout dolls that you placed on large panels of flannel and you moved them about as the story unfolded. Like Ken and Barbie, but made out of paper, pretty much looking like Ken and Barbie. As I grew up, I branched out into other art forms and other Jesuses. The haunted Jesus of Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway, leading Mary Magdalene to plaintively sing, I don't know how to love him. The good buddy Jesus of 1970s rock and roll, put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water, and the huge hit, oh happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. How cool was Jesus if, if they could sing about him on Top 40 Radio or Casey Kasem's Countdown? And there was the almost hippie, good vibes, tragic, comic Jesus of Godspell and the Cotton Patch Gospels on and off Broadway. A little vaudeville, little slapstick, some great music, happy till it's not, and then happy once again. And if you grew up in 20th century Protestant churches, you mostly sang pretty hymns about a nice Jesus. Oh, there was the occasional, alas, and did my Savior bleed, or there is a fountain filled with blood. But for the most part, we sang, tell me the stories of Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus, friend, so kind and gentle. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. Jesus, lover of my soul, softly and tenderly Jesus is calling. Fairest Lord Jesus. Eventually I grew up and after failing Art Appreciation 101 in college, I actually started to appreciate art. All the greats, all the classics, the Dutch masters and the Italian legends, Rembrandt and Caravaggio and those legendary Bible stories captured on canvas and sculpted in marble. No surprise, the artist's models were European, the biblical village scenes were portrayed as European, the clothing and food and, and everything else portrayed European. And why not? That's what they knew. Then I began to travel across Africa, across India, across Latin America, the Caribbean. And guess what? They paint and sculpt what they know. Black Jesus, brown Jesus, Asian Jesus, African village settings for Bethlehem, Nicaraguan and Indian and Peruvian settings for all the Bible stories. And Bible characters wearing colorful clothing, uh, living in houses, eating food from those cultures from those regions, from those tribes. Saris and kente cloth and sombreros, rice and bean, curry and fufu on the table. Each culture reshaping Jesus and Christianity to their form. That's just in art and culture, but it's also equally true in theology and Christology. Theology is God talk, the study of God. Christology is more specific, the study of Jesus Christ. And all that changes from place to place and century to century. In my book, and you'll hear that phrase a lot in the next year, in my book I quote a scholar who refers to the Jesus of each epoch, the Jesus of each epoch. It's the idea that things change a lot. Things change dramatically every generation or so, even every decade. Things change personally for us every year, even daily. It's true of family history, of national history, of personal history. It's true of religion and of culture and business. Things change. We change. The world changes. What attracts our attention changes. What captures our imagination changes. Through it all, for 2,000 years, in the middle of it all, stands Jesus. Jesus. But which Jesus? In the last 200 years, there have been at least two diametrically opposed efforts with Jesus. One to maximize him, the other to minimize him. 
The maximization of Jesus emphasizes his, his majesty, his royalty, the coming day when all the world's powers will bow down before him, this fierce warrior king triumphant over all. The minimization of Jesus brings him down a peg or two, turns him into a sort of Jewish Dalai Lama, a wandering holy man, guru, a do-gooder, nice guy. Is he one? Or the other, or both, or maybe better. In that little Paris cafe, I read up on and then began to list uh, the names and titles that people have come up with over the years to break away from the old-timey Christ of, of power and divinity or from the feel-good Jesus of Jesus loves me. They have terms like Jesus as the turning point of history, cosmic Christ, King of kings, son of man, light of the Gentiles, the true image, the monk who ruled the world, the model exemplar, universal man, prince of peace, teacher of common sense, liberator, Salvator Mundi, the bridegroom of the soul, poet of the spirit, mirror of the eternal. Again, which Jesus? I was reading this week about a prominent church, one of America's largest churches that has been led for the past 60 years by uh, two of America's most influential pastors. The current one has been a key player in Texas's new laws against abortion. The previous one really didn't much bother about the issue of abortion. So here are two pastors of the same church, the same denomination, the same politics, preaching Jesus, Jesus, full-time Jesus yet total opposites almost on one of the most significant issues of the last 60 years. That is an example of the dichotomy that surrounds Jesus. It is not an exaggeration to say that many of the worst things done in the last few centuries were done in the name of Jesus, and some of the best things done were done in the name of Jesus. What do we make of this? What do I make of this? In one of the most profound conversations in the Bible, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? What's the gossip? What do people make of me? And then Jesus looks Peter right in the eye and says, who do you say that I am? What do you make of me? Who is your Jesus? What I've done in these last 25 years and in this new book is to simplify things to break it down, to break down religion, to break down Christianity, to break down Jesus to the essential. In most things in life, there comes a time when we need to break it down. I'm a writer, for example, 50 years of writing sermons and books and poems and essays, and in every writing effort, there is that point where I get tangled up in a sentence, I lose my way in a paragraph, I'm drowning in my own words, and after countless fits and starts to fix it, I finally have to break it down. I have to forget all the effort I put into writing already. I have to forget all the corrections that I've made already. I have to forget all the noble thoughts that I thought were so inspired. I need to break it down. And I ask myself, what is it that I'm trying to say? And then I say it. For those of you who are into sports, it's the same thing, golf, tennis, your favorite ski run, a basketball shot. For me, it was baseball. Every season, there comes a point where your game is off, your swing isn't working, and you try to tweak it, you try to fix it yourself. Nothing. Finally, you have to break it down to the basics, to the essential. Not the fancy, not the complex, not the overreach. In baseball, when I was slumping, I would choke way up on the bat, or I would shorten my swing, or I might even bunt. In practice, I'd play pepper. Bat meets ball, period. My Jesus breaks it down. 2,000 years of Christianity, all sorts of Christians breaking off in this direction and that direction, hating on one another, dividing, excluding, fighting, literally fighting, literally killing one another. 2,000 years of wasted faith, wasted opportunity, wasted Jesus. My lofty goal is to reclaim Jesus, 
to break down the religion that bears his name, Christianity, and zero in on his heart and his essence. Now, let's switch gears entirely as I close with a story from India. When I began our mission work, Foci, Friends of Christ in India, I did so with two amazing Indian friends, Azariah and Sister Mary Sitama. Sister Mary grew up in India as a Hindu at a time when child marriages still happen. While still a little girl, not even a teenager, she was married to a much older adult uncle. The uncle soon died. So Mary was still just a little girl and a widow, both the worst things to be in those old days, confined and restricted in every way, only a life of, of drudgery and loneliness ahead. As life became unbearable, she became desperate and she attempted two forms of escape, suicide and running away. She felt abandoned at every turn by everyone. Miraculously, what saved her life was a small group of Jesus' followers. In the name of Jesus, in the spirit and the pathway of Jesus, they welcomed her. They made her life matter. They loved her unconditionally. Jesus became the bright light in her life, not some doctrine, not tradition, not denomination. Just Jesus, my Jesus, maybe yours. Let's find out. For our time of prayer this morning, David has asked me to share with you the prayer that I offered at Fairfield's 9-11 Remembrance yesterday, Saturday, September 11th. We gathered at the fire department with police officers and firefighters, all of whom remembered before God with thanksgiving and sorrow, those who lost their lives helping others, and those who were trapped waiting for help. Listen now as we pray together. God of hope and God of strength, be with us on this weekend that is sacred to us forever. This weekend we remember that when people ask God for help, you, God, send people. When people call on you for help, you send people. 20 years ago, thousands called on you for help, and hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds came to them. This weekend, we grieve for the thousands lost, and we remember those who ran to help them. The community of first responders who heard God calling them to the towers, and the hundreds of others who with them ran toward the flames drawn by invisible cords of courage and of love. God, speak to us through our sorrow. For those whose names we still utter with grief, for those whose names are etched in stone in a place we now hold sacred, for those whose hearts were broken 20 years ago, and those forever altered by sickness and by loss, when people call for help, God, you send people. Help us to be those people. May the strength of those we mourn give us strength. May the faith of those we remember give us faith. May your hope give us hope. And may we, each day, remember the words that Father Michael Judge, FDNY chaplain, spoke each morning. Lord today. Take me where you want me to go. Amen. And now, friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of this spirit be with us all now and forevermore.